Channel 13 just reported that Baltimore drivers are the worst. <laughs> Stop the presses, right? We need Channel 13 to tell us that? Apparently, Allstate Insurance conducted a study of 200 American cities and ranked them according to the number of accident claims they made in any given period. So it seems, for example, that the national average is for a driver to file one accident claim about every 10 years. In Baltimore, we file an accident claim once every four years. Now, having lived in Boston for three years, I always thought they were the worst drivers. Well, close. They came in at 199 out of 200. But Baltimore still ranked 200 out of 200. Makes you just want to go out for a spin today, doesn't it? <laughs> we are now back to the Gospel of Mark after several weeks of having read from the Gospel of John and the Bread of Life discourse. At this point in the story, some Pharisees and scribes have come to challenge Jesus about their, his disciples' failure to observe certain Jewish customs. If you want to follow along, we are at chapter 7 of Mark's Gospel, right at the very first verse. So Mark tells us, Now, when the Pharisees with some scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus, they observed that some of his disciples ate their meals with unclean, that is, unwashed, hands. And then Mark goes on to describe these customs that had developed over time, that involved the washing of hands and the purification of various vessels. And then a debate ensues between them and Jesus where Jesus accuses them of really not being concerned about the laws of God, but really only being concerned about the customs of humans. We're not going to go into all of that uh, debate because really Jesus finally answers the challenge of the scribes and Pharisees towards the end of the passage. So we're going to skip all the way to verse 14 of chapter 7. So in response to this accusation that the, his disciples are unclean because they don't observe these customs, Jesus summoned the crowd again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. Nothing that enters one from outside can defile that person. But the things that come from within are what defile. Now, he elaborates on that in a passage that's not in our reading. So if you have your Bible, you'll see we're going to continue at verse 18. Jesus says, everything that goes into a person from outside cannot defile, since it enters not the heart, but the stomach, and passes into the latrine. But what comes out of a person, that is what defiles. Okay, now you may have noticed this reference to the heart and to the stomach. And remember a few weeks ago we talked about in the ancient world, the people did not associate our emotions with the heart as we do today. For them, the emotions were located in your stomach, in your gut. Remember we talked about some of that still exists when we say I have a gut feeling about something. 
For the ancients, the heart was the center of the person's true being, where their deepest thoughts or desires or intentions were in essence their soul resided, although they would not have used the term soul in that time. And so when Jesus is talking about the heart, he's talking about the very essence, the very being of the person. And so what he's saying is that anything we put from outside into us does not really go into the heart, it just goes into the stomach. And as a result, it cannot defile us. But he's really being a little bit more symbolic by saying anything that's from outside of us that we allow to form us isn't necessarily either going to defile us or even make us holy. So following a bunch of external rules, for example, even though the rules are good and are trying to achieve good things, just following them are not going to make us holy because they're not coming from the heart. They're outside of us. And as well, even bad things from outside don't really defile us. They only defile us if they come from within our heart. And so that's why he can conclude from within people, from their hearts come evil thoughts, unchastity, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, licentiousness, envy, blasphemy, arrogance, folly. Did you leave anything out? <laughs> you see something in there that you might know a little bit about? He says, all of these evils come from within, and they are what defile. Now, I think Jesus is making a very important point here. He's telling us that religious rules and regulations only have value if they are linked to a proper inner disposition toward God and goodness. Jesus had a great deal of respect for the law. Remember, in the Gospel of Matthew, he says that he has come not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. So this debate with the Pharisees isn't about whether Jesus cares about rules. Jesus does care about rules, but only so far as they are accompanied with the proper inner attitude that draws us closer to God. In our first reading, Moses tells the people that God gave them the law so that others will see just how close God is to the people and how close they can be to God. That's the purpose of the law, that it will bring us closer, God and us together. But Jesus cautions us that just following the rules isn't going to make us holy or isn't going to protect us from defilement. I had a former pastor, Monsignor Joe Luca, at St. Louis Church in Clarksville, who was very fond of saying, you can sit in a garage all day long, but that won't make you a car. <laughs> So if all you do is come to church on Sunday, why would you think that's going to make you a Christian? Our religious rules need to make us better people, not just better rule followers. Now, we don't always expect the same from our civil laws. Our traffic laws, for example, may or may not make you a better driver, but I sure as heck expect you to follow them because that's what I'm hoping is going to keep me safe. 
And maybe that's what some Baltimore drivers need to do more of than anything else. Just follow the rules. But when I teach you moral rules, I'm not just hoping that you will follow them. I'm hoping that they will help you become a better person. But that can only come from within your heart because only what is truly within can affect who we are. Sadly, it seems that we are living in a time when people no longer care about a person's inner disposition. When folks say, including some Christians, about Donald Trump that I didn't vote for a Boy Scout, I voted for a president. They're basically saying they're not concerned about his interior disposition. I don't care about who our president is as a person. I only care about whether I agree with his policies and programs. And so yesterday, while our former presidents and our nation were paying tribute to the late Senator John McCain, our current president was out playing golf. Now, could you imagine expressing the same attitude about our religious leaders? Isn't that what the sex abuse crisis is about? the betrayal of priests who presented themselves as holy men by outward appearance, but who were truly defiled from within? And didn't some bishops reveal their own inner defilement when they covered up those abuses and protected abusive priests for the sake of outward appearance? Our inner disposition matters. It's the source of who we are and how we stand before God. It's what brings us into relationship with God and affects just how truly close to him we become. And when it's the source of what we do, it has the power to affect lasting change in the world around us. In a few moments, we're going to be baptizing Adrian. And while we will all see with our eyes the outward sign of water flowing over his head to cleanse him of original sin, we will know in our hearts that God is renewing his inner soul and restoring him to the original image and likeness of God. What a tragedy it would be if we all didn't work to see the inner beauty of Adrian and so many other young people grow and blossom into the bold and loving Christians that God calls them to be. Baltimore may have the country's worst drivers, but all the traffic laws in the world won't be able to change that. The only thing that will change our driving is an interior commitment to become better drivers. In the same way laws and rules and regulations don't make this a better world or even a better church. Only a commitment to live with God at the center of our hearts can do that. It will make this a better place to live because it will make us better people to love. Amen. Amen.